All right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. So we are about to start day two of the Machine Learning and Economic Inequality Conference. And today's start will be focusing on a number of talks um, from a legal perspective. And I'm very happy that our first speaker today is going to be Pauline Kim, who will talk about bias and ML models, legal challenges. And Pauline, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much for including me in, in the conference. I really enjoyed the papers that I was able to see yesterday. And I just regret that I had to leave early. And unfortunately, I'm gonna have to leave early again today uh, because I still have teaching responsibilities. Uh, but my um, talk today, I'm going to focus on inequality that is faced by historically disadvantaged groups. This is not identical to the issue of economic inequality, but it is an important aspect of it because our resources and opportunities are distributed in ways that systematically disadvantage certain groups. Um, and so in my talk, I will be focusing primarily on race and to a lesser extent on gender um, bias and discrimination, um, partly for ease of um, discussion, but also because those are characteristics where I think there's some broad consensus that discriminatory treatment both um, occurs on a widespread basis and is also um, unfair. So um, there are a number of well-documented instances of uh, bias in machine learning. Um, we have seen this um, with the study done on the recidivism um, prediction software used in the US, uh, facial recognition software, uh, policing, predictive policing um, models, all of these have been documented to involve um, and to raise risk of bias against uh, groups that are historically disadvantaged. Um, my particular focus is on the employment relationship. And so I'll be talking about instances um, and risk of bias and discrimination when machine learning models are used to make employment decisions. And in particular, my focus will be on the um, challenges that these technologies pose for the law. Now, I have a colleague who says that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and I am a, a lawyer and a legal scholar. And so I naturally go around looking for legal problems. Um, but even though my talk will be sort of more focused on the legal aspects, I don't mean to suggest that these are only or exclusively legal problems or that law is necessarily uh, the best, the tool best suited to address them. But it's the tool that I'm the most familiar with. Um, and when it comes to dealing with questions of discrimination and bias, there are at least a handful of legal tools that we can begin to um, kind of examine and, and try to leverage. Um, so in my talk, I'm gonna discuss briefly um, a couple of earlier papers I worked on um, looking at risks of bias in the hiring process and in recruitment. And then I'd like to talk about in the second half, um, some current work I'm doing on um, efforts to build um, fair models. Um, so in each of these cases, I will again be touching on um, legal challenges that are posed and, and try to explore some of the legal ramifications. Uh, so in hiring, um, in the hiring context, employers are, have increasingly come to rely on predictive AI tools to sort, screen, and select among job applicants. And um, in earlier work, I have explored uh, the ways in which these technologies have been used and the risks of bias that they pose. Um, one of the promises of um, machine learning was that it could help us to avoid human bias because um, people, people have been making hiring decisions for a long time um, and their innate, uh, whether conscious or unconscious biases have uh, um, historically worked against certain disadvantaged groups. And these phenomena are well established by social science studies. So there's the, the famous study, the field study where the researchers sent out paired resumes and just changed the name on the resume. Um, one of them had a white sounding name, the other had a, a, an African American sounding name, and they found that the responses were quite different, that the, the, the resume with the white sounding name um, got far more callback um, um, interviews, even though um, the underlying uh, qualifications of the person um, were exactly the same. And so the promise of, of turning to um, predictive uh, models was that we could avoid this kind of human um, bias. But the problem is um, those biases can persist and they can be reproduced um, 
in models. And so again, this is a well-known example of Amazon uh, trying to create a um, AI tool that would identify promising candidates uh, for software developer position. Amazon is growing, still is growing um, rapidly. Um, and um, the way they tried to train the tool is by um, asking it to find uh, prospective employees that were similar to their current employees. Uh, but because their current uh, software developers were overwhelmingly male, the tool learned to select primarily for male uh, software developers and to downgrade um, women even when they had um, similar um, skills. Um, so um, these are anecdotal examples. Um, there are a number of different reasons why we can, can uh, expect that there, there is some risk of, of bias appearing in these kinds of models. Um, and this is, uh, I won't go through this, I think this is all well explored um, in the literature, um, but in the employment context, um, there are, are some particular concerns um, that relate to the uh, legal regulation. Um, one is that these models often rely on purely correlational factors um, rather than um, causation. Um, the visual image here is one of my favorite causation, I'm sorry, one of my favorite correlational stories, which is the study that found that people who like curly fries on Facebook um, are more intelligent. There's a strong correlation there, apparently. Um, clearly not a causal relationship. Um, how do we think about that in the employment context where you have characteristic features that are clearly non-causal but are being used in a predictive way? Um, another concern is opacity. Um, there is often a lack of um, information or understanding about exactly what factors are driving predictions and those raise particular concerns in the employment context. Um, once a, a predictive model is deployed in the employment context, uh, the problem is we are no longer gonna observe the counterfactual. If an, an employer is relying um, on the predictions to make hiring decisions, um, it, it may be that the, there appears to be some level of accuracy in the predictions, but we don't actually know about false negatives anymore. Um, and then finally, um, the use of these tools is embedded in a, in a larger system. And one of the things we have to worry about is feedback effects, effects on the labor market more generally. And in particular, if there are forms of systemic bias, um, that can lead to discouraged workers who can actually change worker behavior. Um, so um, just to run through the basics of employment discrimination law, um, it recognizes two forms of discrimination. Um, on, in the US, we call these disparate treatment and disparate impact. I think they're called direct and indirect um, uh, discrimination. Um, um, in other countries, but basically disparate treatment forbids uh, an employer from taking an adverse action because of the protected characteristic, whereas disparate impact uh, prohibits uh, taking, um, engaging in neutral practices that have disproportionate effects on a protected group. Now, one of the things um, that I think sometimes get, gets obscured is the, the mere, um, existence of a disparate impact does not give rise to legal liability. Um, it, it just triggers further inquiry. And the employer always has the possibility of coming back and arguing that the practice which has a disparate impact is one that is in fact related to the job and there's some kind of business necessity for engaging in it. Um, uh, many disparate impact cases actually get resolved um, at this stage in favor of the employer. Um, if they are able to show this kind of job. So um, given the risks of bias in machine learning models when they're used in the hiring context, this poses a number of challenges for anti-discrimination law. Um, first of all, disparate treatment isn't much help here because if we simply remove um, variables for the sensitive characteristics, that's not necessarily going to stop um, the predictive models from having a discriminatory effect. Um, but once we move into the disparate impact side of the theory, um, it's difficult for the law to deal with things like um, unexplained correlations, um, opaque decision processes, because these don't offer any clearly articulated justification for the reason that the impact is occurring. And so for that reason, um, it, it's a little bit um, difficult or uncertain to know how existing anti-discrimination law would apply to a model that has a disparate impact, but we don't really understand the, the underlying reason. Um, so what I have suggested um, is that um, we may need to tweak our understanding of anti-discrimination law 
rather than just taking sort of a, a the employer should know nothing about sensitive characteristics. It may sometimes be important um, um, in situations where uh, predictive models are being used to preserve sensitive data so that the outcomes can be audited. Um, the uh, employer, I think, should have to have show something more than simply a statistical correlation. Um, instead, uh, they should bear a burden of showing that the relationships that they are relying on are statistically valid and substantively meaningful in some way. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time and move on to talk about um, uh, recruitment. Um, so this is another area that I have looked at. Um, if we move the, the employment process back in time a bit um, before the employer is at the point where they're deciding whether or not to, to screen somebody or hire somebody, um, prior to that moment, we now have a number of uh, labor market intermediaries who are, are um, channeling information between potential job speakers and the employer. So these include um, online advertising platforms like Facebook and Google. Um, many, most employers now um, look for employees by posting ads on these types of platforms. Um, there are also platforms like ZipRecruiter that are specifically dedicated to matching applicants and employers. Um, and then there are um, uh, platforms that are promising to help employers find the passive candidate, someone who's not actually actively looking for a job, but would be a great match and could perhaps be recruited away. Um, so the concern with these intermediaries is that they are controlling and shaping the flow of information in labor markets in ways that I think um, has been underappreciated and certainly was not taken into account when existing anti-discrimination law uh, was put into place. Um, so um, I think uh, one of the well-known examples of this was is the Facebook advertising platform. A few years ago, uh, Facebook got quite a lot of negative press because um, uh, it was uh, pointed out that when an advertiser, including somebody who was posting a job, um, was uh, choosing how the ad should be distributed, they had the opportunity to use things like age and gender, which could be used to discriminate, and location, which is often a proxy for race. So the concern was that employers um, with nefarious motives could use these uh, selection tools to try to target their ads um, for job opportunities to particular audiences. And Facebook was sued over these practices, and they eventually settled. Um, and the terms of the settlement required that Facebook um, uh, create a separate portal for housing, employment, and credit advertising, the kinds of things that are sensitive um, and that we worry about discriminatory bias. Um, and in this portal, um, if you were going to post one of these ads, you had to go to this portal. Um, no demographic targeting was permitted, no direct use of, um, no use of attributes that could help you um, discriminate and no location-based targeting um, less than a 15 mile uh, radius, I should say radius. And the idea was by removing these options from the advertiser, the targeted audience would be uh, balanced. Um, but the problem was that even once this target audience was selected by the advertiser, Facebook's ad targeting algorithm would then step in and decide which users actually received the ad. So the algorithm is predicting um, which users are most likely to interact with the ad, likely doing so based on uh, either past behavior or inferences that are being um, drawn about users based on people who are like them. And so the risk is that this ad targeting algorithm would produce skewed delivery of these employment ads, even if the initial targeting criteria were neutral. And in fact, um, there were a couple studies that showed that this, this does in fact happen. Um, this was a study in which uh, the researchers um, posted a number of um, job ads, used neutral uh, language in the ad and in the targeting criteria. And as you can see, the um, ads were distributed in a race and gender skewed way in a way that reflects stereotypes about who would do what kinds of jobs. Um, there was another study 
after the special portal was implemented, um, and this is just one example from that study. This is a construction, construction company that was looking for drivers. Uh, they targeted the ad in a neutral way. And when they looked at the analytics afterwards, the, the, the tall blue bars are um, men and the shorter green bars are women. Um, you can see that the ad was overwhelmingly served to men rather than women. Um, and the company said, that's actually not what we intended at all. We're, we're happy to have men or women. We need, we need drivers. Um, so, um, so the concern here is that the, the algorithm, um, the ad targeting algorithm was introducing a bias that was not intended uh, by the employers who were posting these ads. Um, in addition to the advertising context, we also have platforms like ZipRecruiter that are acting as intermediaries in the job market. And uh, ZipRecruiter, um, one of the ways that it works is if an employer posts a job, um, it scans the tens of thousands of resumes that it has, job seekers have posted, and looks to find the best matches, nudges some individuals to apply for the job. Um, when they do so, that produces a uh, ranked list of recommendations to the employer. And the employer has the opportunity to look at those and to give a thumbs up to some of them saying that this is the kind of person we're looking for. We think this is a great match. Um, and that signal is then used to identify similar candidates. So again, there's a concern that the underlying uh, recommender systems that are driving platforms like ZipRecruiter um, can reproduce uh, bias. And to be clear, I have no knowledge of any problems with ZipRecruiter system, um, but I think there are reasons to worry about uh, platforms like this. Um, one of the problems with, with these job matching platforms is they are not generally able to observe the skills and abilities of workers directly, which means, this means that they are probably primarily uh, um, resting their predictions on observed market behavior. In other words, um, who is likely to be hired uh, by this employer rather than who has the skills to perform this job and to the extent that those prior behaviors might reflect biased judgments or forms of historical workplace bias, there's a risk that they will be reproduced um, um, by these um, uh, predictive models. So um, again, um, the, this, the rising importance of these labor market intermediaries raises some challenges for uh, employment discrimination law. Um, one of the challenges is uh, thinking about this question of who is an applicant. It used to be pretty easy to figure out if somebody could bring a claim alleging that they had been discriminated against or to determine if there was a disparate impact by a given practice by examining the applicant pool and the outcome um, of that practice. But um, now the question of who is an applicant is a little bit more complicated when you have intermediaries who are uh, screening and channeling um, and promoting certain uh, uh, individuals to apply and, and, and perhaps um, not pr uh, being transparent about those uh, opportunities to others. Um, another challenge is figuring out who is responsible if these kinds of biases are happening um, in the recruitment process. The law tends to be very employer focused, so it, it is really uh, uh, the law traditionally has located concerns about discrimination with the employer's decision-making process and has paid less attention to how employees get to the employer. Um, there are provisions for covering employment agencies, but they're not well developed. And there's this sort of um, uncertainty about whether platforms who are that are acting in this way of uh, uh, channeling certain types of information about job opportunities should or can be treated as employment agencies. Um, and then in the US, we have our own peculiar challenge. Um, if platforms were to be held responsible, which is our uh, Section 230 issue of platform immunity, but I, I won't go into that um, here. So, um, so th th this prior work um, has uh, led to some new questions. Um, we know that algorithms can be unfairly biased against historically disadvantaged groups. Um, and as a result, um, I think there's a lot of activity now in the computer science community trying to address bias and try to figure out ways to build fair models. 
but uh, doing so requires an awareness of race or other protected characteristics in the model building process. And so that raises a further legal question. Is the consideration of race or other protected characteristics in the effort to mitigate bias itself a form of unlawful discrimination? And so this is work that I'm working on currently, um, exploring this from a legal perspective. And then, as I'll mention um, in a bit, some experimental work um, with uh, folks here um, on campus at WashU. So uh, before I go into the details of this, um, I just want a couple of caveats. I am not trying to address the ongoing debate about how fairness should be defined. I'm not endorsing any particular model or strategy for mitigating bias and predictive algorithms. Um, I have concerns about some of them, even apart from their potential, potential issues about legal liability. I think those are all really important questions, but I'm not dealing with them here. Um, instead, my purpose here is really just to try to think through, are there any le legal obstacles to undertaking these kinds of efforts? So to go back to the um, model um, of anti-discrimination law, we have two kinds of two theories of discrimination, disparate treatment and disparate impact. And so now I want to delve a little deeper into the disparate, in, disparate treatment side of things. Um, disparate treatment law um, clearly forbids explicitly discriminatory policies. That, that's easy. And it also forbids in, um, actions that are taken with an invidious intent or motivation. Uh, for example, the employer who doesn't hire somebody um, or fails to provoke, promote them because they hold some kind of um, animus or prejudice against that person because of their race or their sex, um, that would be a form of discrimination. Uh, but what about affirmative action? Um, there have been a number of challenges um, in the US, uh, legal challenges brought by white plaintiffs or by men who have argued that taking race or sex into account in any way that benefits, disadvantages, disadvantaged minorities or women um, is itself a form of uh, race or gender discrimination and therefore should be unlawful under existing discrimination law. Um, and so in a series of cases, the US Supreme Court has addressed these issues. Um, many of these are not in the employment context. So here I'm speaking about the legal framework um, somewhat more broadly. Um, and so um, in this series of cases, the Supreme Court has um, articulated um, a couple of, uh, uh, distilled a couple of, of principles. Um, first of all, the Supreme Court has held that using racial classifications, even for a benign purpose, um, like affirmative action, is still, in its view, a form of discrimination. And therefore, it is unlawful unless it can be justified. And in order to be justified, it has to meet the standard of strict scrutiny that the court has laid out. Strict scrutiny would require that the entity that is using um, the racial classification show that it is doing so for a compelling interest and that the means it has chosen to do so are narrowly, narrowly tailored to meet that interest. So um, if we return to this um, summary of anti-discrimination law, we can say that there are three, at least three different ways that disparate tra treatment occurs. And one of them is if an, uh, an employer or other entity engages in affirmative action um, unless that affirmative action um, plan can be justified. Now, um, I, I just want to, an aside here, um, the jurisprudence that has been developed by the Supreme Court has been subject to significant critique. Um, critical race scholars in particular have um, argued that um, the court's um, doctrine, first of all, does not actually reflect uh, constitutional principles and it is, um, and it ignores the way in which neutral practices um, can systematically harm uh, racially disadvantaged groups. But my purpose here is not to engage in that normative debate over what, whether what the Supreme Court has decided is correct or not. Instead, what I wanna do is just accept those cases and that law that it has established at face value and examine that reasoning and ask, um, what, how does this law apply to race aware efforts to mitigate bias in protective models? So uh, to return to this core question is consideration of race or other forms of protective characteristics 
uh, to mitigate bias, is it a form of unlawful discrimination? Now, there are a handful of scholars in the US who have um, started to address this question, and several of them have come to the conclusion that the answer should be yes. It is a form of unlawful discrimination, but, it, or I should say, it is a, they have concluded it's a form of disparate treatment, but it can be justified under existing affirmative action law, at least um, in some circumstances, and they have worked through arguments um, about compelling interest and, and uh, narrow tailoring and so on. But I actually think that this is the wrong approach. I think there's a prior question, which is, is race consciousness in the model building process disparate treatment at all? In other words, before we get to the, the question of whether it can be justified as a form of affirmative action, we should first ask the question, is the use of race in the model building process does it constitute discrimination um, at all? So, um, and I think the answer to this is, is somewhat more complicated um, than the initial answer given by these other um, scholars. So it is certainly true that the court has found that um, some forms of race conscious practices um, are disparate treatment. Um, and generally speaking, if you look at those cases, they involve racial classification. In the typical case, you have a government or a private entity that is applying a racial classification to individuals at the time of decision to determine whether or not that individual will receive a resource or a benefit. So for example, some of the cases that came in front of the Supreme Court involved, um, one of them involved a medical school that set aside a certain fixed percentage of seats in the incoming class for minorities. Um, another involved um, university admissions where, uh, based on race, certain applicants could get an automatic boost of a certain fixed number of points for their application. Um, others have involved uh, government contracting programs where a certain per fixed percentage were set aside for minority-owned um, companies that wanted to contract, uh, obtain these contracts. So in these kinds of situations, the court has said the use of racial classifications triggers strict scrutiny. In other words, it's unlawful unless the demanding standards of strict scrutiny can be satisfied. But race consciousness is not the same thing as racial classification. And the law has also recognized a number of race conscious practices that don't constitute disparate treatment. And so they don't trigger this strict scrutiny at all. They're considered lawful. So for example, employers are permitted to pursue a goal of increasing the diversity of their workforce. Um, in doing so, they may do things like change their recruitment practices in order to attract a more diverse applicant pool. They may change their testing procedures if they find out that a test that they're using is having an unintended and unjustified disparate impact on minority workers. In trying to develop a new test, they may do something like deliberately oversample minority workers in developing the test in order to ensure that it is fair to all groups. Um, the Supreme Court has also suggested, now this is more in dicta than in um, cases that have actually been decided, um, but the Supreme Court has suggested that government entities can do things like um, engage in targeted outreach to minority communities or taking into account the racial impacts of different policies in deciding questions like, for example, where to site, um, locate a new school. Um, government is also permitted to seek to remove barriers that have prevented minority owned businesses from competing successfully for government contracts. These practices are all race conscious and they all appear to be lawful, which means that they require no special justification before a court. So to go back to my original question, are, is race consciousness in the model building process disparate treatment at all? I think it's important to recognize that anti-discrimination law does permit some forms of race conscious actions intended to remove arbitrary and unfair effects that disadvantage um, certain groups. Um, whether a particular use of race in this process is disparate treatment will depend on how it is used. Um, and this is where, um, you know, these are sort of tentative thoughts where um, um, I'm, I'm sort of trying to work out the implications of this, but certainly um, I think there's a pretty clear case that efforts to de-bias models by dealing with data problems, um, thinking about things like whether we have representative data, how it's being labeled, um, 
you know, uh, whether their bias is built into the data and trying to remove it. Those to me should all be entirely legally permissible. They shouldn't be considered a form of um, disparate treatment that somehow triggers this, this kind of special scrutiny. Um, another category of strategies involves using protected characteristics at training time, but not at prediction time. So the training process is then makes use of the protected characteristics to try to build a model in a way that um, would uh, minimize the bias. But then at the time of prediction, the, the individual whose um, outcome is being predicted, um, there's no, for that individual, there's no access to race information. And so it's not part of the prediction process. And I think that arguably those kinds of strategies are not just for treatment either. Although with a caveat that if somebody were doing this sort of intentionally trying to design, um, design a facially neutral model with invidious intent, that could cross the line to disparate treatment and should um, be um, subject to scrutiny. Um, but the more difficult, most difficult question I think is what about uh, models that take advantage of uh, or use the uh, protected characteristic of race um, at prediction time? Or how would that, those be treated under the law? Um, and, and using race at prediction time um, may uh, sound like a racial classification. And depending on how it's used, it may be considered a form of disparate treatment and therefore subject to strict scrutiny. But I think it's not universally true. I think it may depend on the ways in which uh, race is used and the actual impact that it has. Um, so this um, leads into another project that I've been working on. And this is with uh, folks in the computer science uh, department here at Washington University. Um, one of the arguments that has driven challenges to affirmative action is the assumption that by taking race into account um, in a way that is intended to be fair for, for previously disadvantaged groups, that other individuals who are not part of those groups are somehow being harmed by that. Um, and so this raises the question when we're dealing with uh, race aware models, um, what is the impact on individuals in the population um, from these uh, race conscious efforts um, to uh, uh, impose um, some kind of uh, fairness um, outcomes. So um, the argument here is that in order to evaluate whether an individual has suffered from disparate treatment, we need, need to know what kind of an impact the fairness strategy is having on the particular individual. And so that's, that's the um, current project, looking at the individual impact of, of group fairness. Um, and in this project, we are trying to ask this question, how does the move to group fairness learning models impact individuals as compared with the outcome under um, conventional learning? So a naive view um, might say, uh, well, and this is a, a, I think is sort of parallels arguments that have made by some challengers of affirmative action programs. Um, a naive view might say, well, if I'm not part of the group that is intended to be benefited by this program and I don't receive a positive outcome, then I must have suffered from a discriminatory action. You took race into account. I didn't get the, the resource or the benefit. And so I have been discriminated against. But um, that can't be true of everyone in a situation that involves scarce resources. Not everyone who applies will get hired. Not everyone who applies will be admitted to university, uh, regardless of race. Um, so we would want to see um, whether that person would have gotten a positive outcome in the baseline situation, in this case under a conventional learning model, to see if their situation changed once the fairness model was adopted. So um, if someone would have received the resource or opportunity in the conventional model, but not under the fairness constrained model, then you might argue they have been impacted uh, by the adoption of the fair model. And so we call this observed impact. But this is not quite right either, because there is not a single objective authoritative solution in the baseline condition. And so we can't say with any certainty whether a particular individual would or would not have gotten the resource. Um, instead, it's more accurate to say that there are a multitude of possible models that could have been used in the baseline condition. And this set of models includes a number of variations that will occur not only from the choice of the mathematical model, but what data set is chosen, which subset is used for training, what features are included, how the data is labeled, and so on. 
Now, the same would be true about the fairness model. There's, there's uncertain, there's a set of models that are, are chosen there, but for the moment, we'll ignore that. Uh, but just focusing on the variation in the baseline condition, um, we think it's more accurate to characterize the individual as having had some probability of a positive outcome in the baseline condition, which can then be compared with their outcome under the group fairness model. So understanding the impact of adopting fairness strategies is more nuanced than simply saying that someone who's not a member of a mi minority group is automatically harmed when group fairness considerations are built into a model. So we are trying to explore this question experimentally. Um, we are assuming a situation in which there's a machine learning model that is used to make predictions and it will be used to allocate resources. Um, the resource is a scarce resource, so not everybody will get it. Um, and um, the, when we look at the baseline condi condition, understanding that there are a number of different conventional machine learning models that could be used, um, we still simplify by choosing a, a particular conventional machine learning model. And then what we do is we see what uh, random variation in the data what effect that that will have, because um, the idea is that just the random variation in the data in and of itself, even with a fixed conventional model, is going to produce some natural variation um, in outcome in terms of whether a particular individual has allocated a resource. Um, and so uh, what we are doing is we have uh, on several different data sets we're working with, but for each of them, we draw 50 random subset samples. Um, we use each of those subsamples to train a model, and then we observe the probability that a particular individual is given the resource across these 50 models. And we call that sort of, we call that the natural variation in outcome. That's the variation that occurs just as a result of the, the random draws of the data um, to, to train the model. Um, that natural variation can produce what we call phantom effects. In other words, if you looked only at the observed impact um, which I outlined on an earlier slide, and you, and you don't take into account the natural variation, the impact on a given individual may look much larger than it actually is. And then we argue that the actual impact is more accurately measured by marginal impact, the observed impact less than natural variation that occurs in the baseline condition. So um, we have some, uh, our preliminary findings, although we're still working through this, um, First, um, there's a meaningful amount of natural variation that occurs um, when, in, in terms of whether a given individual will receive a resource and that results simply from the random draws of the training data. Um, the observed impact is often larger, sometimes much larger than the marginal impact. In other words, that the, there's a, because there's a meaningful amount of natural variation, um, there's often a big difference between observed impact and what we think is the actual, should be the actual measure of marginal impact, uh, which means there are these phantom effects from the naive point of view, uh, the effects may appear to be much more significant than they actually are. Um, the, the size of these effects depends very heavily on the characteristics of the data set, the scarcity of the resource, the type of classifier used, and so on. And so uh, the bottom line is this idea of how is an individual impacted by group fairness models is um, very complicated to measure and um, somewhat, uh, I wouldn't say somewhat, it is very highly contingent on um, other uh, factors. So um, drawing lessons then um, both from anti-discrimination and for anti-discrimination law from the, this investigation, um, I would say, first of all, um, it's important to keep in mind that the law does permit, at least in the US, um, permit some race conscious actions when they're intended to remove arbitrary or unfair effects. And that that should be sort of the first question in thinking about race conscious uh, model building strategies is, is this something that would uh, trigger strict scrutiny or is this something that would fall on the side of not being considered disparate treatment in the first place? Um, so again, whether it's disparate treatment depends specifically on how race is used in a particular process. Um, I think it uh, suggests that it would be good to better understand what causes bias in machine learning models. Um, and that may matter for legal purposes. Um, 
in terms of determining um, whether or not this is a form of disparate treatment or simply a matter of removing um, the source of bias. Um, and then um, I think it, it, we need to think a little more carefully about um, the actual impacts of different approaches that we take to debiasing models um, on both the protected groups um, and non-protected um, populations. So I think, um, I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop right there. Oh, that was fascinating. Who has any questions? Right, maybe I'll start with, uh, with kind of a high level question, which I've been wondering about for a little while, kind of coming to this as an economist as opposed to somebody from law, which is how we think about kind of this focus on attributing responsibility. And I feel like there's a lot of inequalities that are generated by technology and uh, more general systemic factors, I guess, that we can't really attribute to anybody's particular animus or bias. And so I'm wondering what, what we're losing by this, the, this legal focus on somebody being responsible for discrimination and how you think about that. Yeah, so, um, so that, that, is, that is a problem. Um, and I think one of the, th that's one of the mismatches, I think, between the, um, the way the discrimination law is, um, was written and designed in sort of our current situation, which is the law tends to look for a specific responsible entity, right? Whether that's the employer, uh, supervisor who has a discriminatory intent or the employer who per perhaps, you know, adopts a, a test that is not justified and has discriminatory um, impacts. And so um, the, the use of these models, I think, um, has runs the risk of, uh, of kind of um, taking forms of either uh, cognitive biases out there or systemic biases and then sort of, you know, sort of pushing them through these systems so that they're reproduced. Um, and, and the question is, you know, so I think one, one response would be, well, um, the employer wasn't responsible for societal discrimination to begin with, so why should they be responsible now? Um, but, but I'm not sure that that's an adequate answer because um, by incorporating these uh, models into their decision-making process, they are um, systematizing uh, and drawing on these historical forms of disadvantage in ways that uh, are, are, they're really sort of scaling them up, right? So there's reason to be concerned about them. Um, and, but, but it doesn't solve the problem, the legal problem of how exactly we assign responsibility for that, right? Um, so I, I think that that's, that's one of the challenges. I think when the employer is using one of these tools, um, there is reason um, to make them have to at least justify it. So that's why when I was talking about the disparate impacts earlier on, um, tweaking the, the theory so that the employer bears the burden of showing that at the very least that a model that they're using is, um, ha has some statistical validity and is, has, is substantively meaningful in some sense. Because the idea behind disparate impact has been the employer has to justify um, if it has a disparate impact, the employer has to justify its use um, by pointing to some kind of um, biz business considerations. And some of those considerations have been um, ruled, even though they appear to be facial and neutral, have been ruled to be a form of discrimination. So for example, if an employer says, um, I'm, I'm going to um, you know, uh, not hire anybody that is predicted to have breaks in their employment, that's obviously going to have an impact on women, um, given the sort of career trajectories of, of many women and, and the fact that they take time for caregiving. If we know what the reason is, we can examine that reason and say, wait a minute, that looks like a proxy. Um, that looks like a form of statistical discrimination based on gender, that shouldn't be allowed. And if the employer can just sort of say, well, we just have this model and it just looks like this group of people are predicted to do better and we don't know why, we can't really interrogate those underlying reasons. So that's one of the reasons why I, I argue that in the disparate impact context, there ought to be more of a burden of justification um, when these models have um, disparate impacts. Um, there's a question from Ruben. Hi, um, thanks for a super interesting talk. Um, I just was wondering about the, the research you were talking about towards the end about measuring the impact on individuals. Was that, was that comparing just the outcomes uh, under the 
uh, the, the sort of basic model versus the fairness corrective model. Um, yeah. And, and sort of follow on, is it is that connected to, so there's been some recent work by, um, I forget her name now, um, but it was looking at like how we could um, quantify individual level probabilities, which is a philosophically interesting question, right? But um, is it is it related to that? Like, is it is just that, about observing different- Is that the leave one out fairness that you're- Leave one out first. That's another. Yeah, that's another related topic. Yeah, think of a different yeah it is. I mean, so I, I'm not sure if that's the same one. The, the leave one out fairness, I think, is coming at the question from a somewhat different angle, right, in terms of thinking about the arbitrariness of outcomes, right, for at the individual level, given all this noise that goes on. Um, and so I think it has a somewhat different motivation than our project. But the I think the common thing is um, recognizing that there's some, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, it's probably the wrong word from a technical point of view, but there's some instability in the models, right? It, that, and, and the reason I got interested in this question is because in talking to law people and policy people, there's sort of this implicit assumption that, well, there's, there's one model, right? There's one model and it's going to produce accurate predictions. And then we know that it would either predict you know, success or not success. And that, that's kind of a fixed thing. And the more that I kind of read and tried to educate myself, it appeared to me that like, there is no one model. There's this whole series of choices and depending on which of those choices you make, even in the sort of, when, before we think about fairness constraints, there are a whole different uh, profile of outcomes that are possible. And so, um, so part of this, that's what motivated this project was to think about that in the context of um, anti-discrimination law, where oftentimes the claim by individuals who challenge affirmative action programs is, I would have gotten the resource, and now I'm not getting it, and therefore I have suffered discrimination, and trying to complicate that a little bit and say, um, wait a minute, it, it's not always entirely clear that you would have gotten it, and on top of that, if the reason you would have gotten it is because there's some kind of uh, bias that got built into the system, you're really not being deprived of anything if we're taking that out, right? So, so that's how that's how sort of we frame the question, but it is related to this idea of uh, the paper on the leave one out fairness in terms of, um, you know, there there's a lot of contingency in these models, right? It's not like there's a, a, a single truth that is being discovered from them. Um, and then there's a question from, oh, do you want to carry on? No, oh, no, I'm okay. sorry. Um, there's a question from Yen. Hi there, thank you. Um, I was wondering whether you believe that one approach one could take to ensure the fairness of an algorithm is to uh, train the algorithm only on data from a single societal group to remove any kind of uh, race, gender or something, um, and then use that algorithm. So that should create, a con or I feel like this might create a consistent standard and then roll it out for the other societal groups. Do you think this could alleviate the problem and be, well, be legal in general as well? So I don't think that that would solve the problem because um, one of the things I think that people find on the social science side of things is um, sometimes predictors are quite different across different groups, right? So that what might be a good predictor of whatever it is you're trying to predict, uh, you know, sort of um, um, outcomes for men versus women or for blacks versus white, the predictors, in other words, if you were trying for maximum accuracy, um, you might find that very different features are, are predictive across those two groups. And that just reflects the fact that there are different societal differences in people's experience. So for example, um, going to community college might look like a very different signal for, in, again, this is the US context, right? But going to community college before going on to get a four-year degree might look like quite a different signal for blacks versus whites in the United States. And, and so um, the, the problem with taking, training the model on one group um, in and then just applying it to the other groups. And if it doesn't apply well to the other groups, those groups are going to be getting 
potentially being disadvantaged because um, a predictive model that doesn't really apply to your situation um, um, uh, is being used to, to make predictions for them. Um, there are situations where taking race or gender into account can actually produce more accurate predictions for both groups. And so that's one of those situations where when I had, you know, if race is used at, predictive, at prediction time, is that a form of disparate treatment question mark? Uh, because in a situation like that, if it's actually improving outcomes for both groups, it's, it's not clear that anybody's being harmed by the use of race. But we, we have a very, uh, again, in the US, a very sort of reflexive, well, we, can't, we shouldn't talk about race. But I think sometimes actually um, exploring what the differences are, trying to understand them, trying to understand where they come from might help us build fairer models um, in the long term. And that's why one of the things I'm interested in from a legal perspective is to, is, uh, to provide some room for um, designers and the entities who use these models to, to begin to do that kind of exploration and, and to increase our understanding. Let's do one more question by Joshua and then turn it over to Jeremy. Thanks. So um, I'm really interested in the, in the way that you're uh, challenging this idea that um, race uh, consciousness could be could be dif different treatment, like it, it might not be different treatment, depends mm -hmm. on exactly how you're using it. And I think that combined with uh, like the focusing on earlier causes of the observed uh, disparity would be a way of, of establishing that. And I, I wonder also if um, another way that you could think about challenging this would be to question whether the different treatment is actually um, an adversity, because uh, you know it, it might suppose I don't gain admission to a certain school, but as a result that school is not segregated, um, it could actually be the case that everyone is better off in a world in which the schools are not segregated. Yeah. So um, so I think that that is an important sort of policy argument at a higher level and certainly would be a basis for critique of the narrow focus that the Supreme Court has taken on this you know, question of you know, the, the impact of a racial classification they're looking at very, very narrowly. Um, I'm not sure, I, I guess because as I said earlier, part of what I'm trying to do in this project is to take Supreme Court law as it has been established on its own terms. Um, I'm not sure that that would fly with our you know, in the current framework, I think it's a, an important argument. I think from a policy perspective, it's an important thing to think about. Uh, but in terms of this somewhat narrow space I've given myself to work in, which is accepting um, existing doctrine, um, I'm not sure that will will work to open up more space. Although it's, it's, it's an interesting thought and I'll definitely um, give it some more uh, consideration. Thank you. 